Hello, welcome to this session. Today I'm going to talk about an interesting problem related to key derivation. And the problem is very simple. We are given a random or a uniform key in the key space of um, all possible keys of uh, size 128 bit. Uh, that's, that's what this notation is showing. Uh, we are asked to find or derive a set of keys from, from given key. So we are given one key K and we are asked to find or derive a list of new keys from key K. How do we go about it? Um, before I show my implementation, I will give you a general high level idea. Actually, we can use AES for this particular pro problem. What we will do is we'll basically call AES using the key K we are given and we evaluate at zero. Zero in this case denotes um, zero means bunch of zeros, 128 times. Um, that's because AES block size is 128, okay? So this is the idea. Suppose you want another key, we simply do the same. We call AES at 0 0.1, 0 0.2 and so on. Okay, actually uh, in my implementation, I start with um, one, so I will be consistent here. What is one? One in this case means um, one is a constant, right? So something like this. We can easily derive a lot of keys from one master key K. And AES is extremely fast. That's the reason I picked this approach. You may also another other possibilities. Other possibilities. What are the other options we have? We could apply HMAC at k equal to one. HMAC k comma two and so on to produce new keys. That's also perfectly fine. However, HMAC is relatively slower than AES. Therefore, um, I'm going to show an implementation which uses this idea. Okay, why, why would this be an independent key? Um, the reason is this, that AES behaves like a random function. So uh, the output is usually not, uh, um, not a function of the input. Um, um, at least that's what we all think. So it's, it's, it is of course a function of inputs, but in general, it's difficult to trace how the inputs map to the outputs. Therefore, um, this is considered as a random key. Okay, so there are many, many cases where you would need such, such a setup where you have one, one key and you would like to generate a bunch of keys, either for encrypting a different customer's data or for encrypting a passwords for interaction with other systems and so on. So we would need multiple keys uh, derived from one key in, in many, many cases. And this is a really handy approach. Once you have the master key, you simply call AES uh, uh, and encrypt at a certain constant values like one, two, and so on. Okay, so let me now show you my implementation and we will talk about uh, um, the, the idea of um, key derivation quickly. So I'm going to show you my implementation and talk about how I derive 10 keys actually. This is an, it's a constant, you can play with it. It's just a proof of concept code anyways. Um, I'm going to talk about AES key size 128, but um, at the end of the video, I will talk about how you could change it to 256 very easily. That's not the main problem. Uh, AES block size is a fixed constant, 16 bytes. So this is what we are given, right? We are given a master key. So here's the master key. And we are going to derive a bunch of keys from the master key. How do we do that? Um, we start with this byte array called number. In, in Java, when you create a byte array, it's initialized to zero as far as I know. So number is initialized to zero. And then we increment the number by one. Okay, inc function is a little utility that we increment the number by one. And then we, I just print it for, for showing you that. Then we encrypt the number using this key. Okay, in the, in the past videos, my parameters were different ordered. First, I put the data and then a key. Usually in, in cryptography, we put the key first and then the data second. So just want you to be aware of that. Once you get the encrypt function, um, once we call the encrypt function, we, we, we get the output, which is which we treat the sub key. And we continue this for um, 
number of key times, right? That, that's how we generate the keys. Let's quickly compile this and run it. We have something like this. Okay, so I generated 10 keys, right? This is my master key, K, key K, and I use this number and encrypt this number using this master key to produce the first sub key. Okay, this is the first AES key. And then I, I choose this number two and encrypt again using this master key to, to get uh, this sub key. So basically that's all. You, you, you can simply call AES as many times as you wanted, uh, have a simple counter like number, and then uh, you get a new key. You don't have to call a random function. Um, sometimes uh, it's, it's more convenient to have only one key and derive a lot of keys from that master key, especially um, if, if uh, two sites have already have the master key, it's much easier to generate new keys in this fashion, okay? A few things that I would like to call um, um, your attention uh, on, the encrypt function itself uses a only, uh, um, well, it uses only one block of data, right? The number itself is a block of data, as you can see. Therefore, in this case, it's perfectly okay to use uh, the ECB mode, okay? Although there are many uh, criticism out there on ECB mode, which I uh, agree in general, but in this case, let's pay attention. Why is this okay? First of all, I assert that the input data matches the block size. So it's, it cannot be used to encrypt more than 128 bit of data. Right, and the reason why I have to use ECB is that in Java, if you want to encrypt only one block, there, there is no other way to do to to use AES. And of course, it's it's not a criticism of Java. Um, if your goal is to encrypt one block of data and you know for sure all the the input messages are different, then there is nothing wrong with ECB. There is no notion of collusion whatsoever. Okay, so that's the reason I use this, and and then the rest is simple. And there is, of course, no padding in this case because my input is exactly aligned with 128 bit or 16 bytes block input. All right, that's all. And then the decrypt is the same. Okay, so uh, this is one simple way to generate lots of keys. And as I shown earlier, the, encrypt, the, the increment function that increments the number 0, 1, 2, and so on is, is basically this little block of code, which I took it from some of the libraries online. Basically, it increments the byte. By, uh, by one value and you keep calling the encrypt. Okay, so um, if you're not convinced yourself, why would this be a good cryptographic key? Why, why do you think the sub key is a, is a good key? If you're not convinced about that, I encourage you to think about the behavior of AES, okay? So um, I will now show you this particular problem. This is a problem given by Professor Jonathan Cutts and um, Yuda Lindell in their book, problem number 3.14. I'm not going to prove the, the solution, prove and or offer the solution to this problem, but let's let's read this a problem statement. If f is a length preserving pseudorandom function, AES itself is, is actually a length preserving pseudorandom function. You feed in 128 bit of data, you get back 128 bit of data, so it preserves the length. Uh, what they are saying here is that. If we define a function g of s, by the way, s means seed, which is the master key that I've shown you in this case, um, you can keep calling your AES and evaluate at point one, two, all the way up to L, um, and then you can concatenate this, this, this uh, two parallel lines means concatenate. What you get back is basically a pseudo-random generator. So you could take one key and generate n keys easily. Essentially, that's what this, this problem 3.14 is all about. If you wanted to generate a lot of random numbers from one random number, this is one perfect approach to do. Okay, that's what I just did. I took the master key and encrypted point one, two, and so on. And, and of course, how long L can be? Um, if you go back to birthday paradox, we talked about that some time ago. Um, AES itself is a 128-bit block cipher, so we can call, um, according to birthday paradox, um, uh, AES 2 power 64 times. So after calling AES 2 power 64 times, uh, we may expect collusion, okay? So anyway, 2 power 64 is a large number. So many keys can be generated, right? With 2 power 64 uh, times calling AES like this. Yes, by the way, it's the master key in my context. And I keep calling AES and evaluate at point one, two, and so on. That's basically what I did. Okay, and now, 
I will also show you how I can implement this very quickly, right? Um, I put together an implementation. So I will just paste it here for you and show you uh, how easy it is to actually generate the, so here's the other piece of code, PRG, like pseudo random generator. Key, key in this case is the yes on the, on the diagram uh, of the exercise book. And then uh, L is the number expansion, how many times you wanted to call a yes, right? And it's basically doing the same, you know, it, it increments the number each time and then calls encrypt. It's the same code as this, this, this portion of code, but you are going to get one block of uh, byte array. Of course, you need to validate the L, you know, otherwise you, if L is a user input, you're going to blow up. Um, if your array is so huge, I leave that as an exercise for you to do that. But at this point, that's not my main concern. So I'm going to just call this PRG and show you how I can generate, say, a large number of random numbers, you know, which I can use it for my AES 256 key, 256 bit keys if I wanted. For example, I call like this, right? And I say four, why do I say four in this case? Four means I will have to call AES four times, right? One, two, three, four times. Each time I call AES, I get 128 bit output. So with, by calling it four times, I can now easily produce two 256 bit AES key, right? That's what I'm going to do. So I'm just going to uh, print this in hex. So I will be doing this now. I will just print this for you. Okay, actually we can, we don't need this code now. I will just uh, come to this. We don't need to run this code. Yes, so white confusions, right? Okay, so we are given one master key and we got uh, two AES keys of size 256 bit. Okay, why do I say that? We can check how many bytes did we get from our PRG. Okay, we got 128 ASCII characters, right? Which means 60, 64 hex bytes in terms of hex, which means uh, two AES keys can be, you can just take the first uh, 32 bytes to make one AES key and the next 32 bytes to make the next AES key. If your goal is to have 256 bit AES key, this is perfectly fine approach, okay? So um, you probably have read about a HKDF, like the hashed key derivation functions. They are valuable and I have talked about the, those in my videos. Uh, but in this case, I have not used HKDF because my initial key material is actually a, a key coming from the key space of 128 bit random numbers, right? So I have a perfect, um, um, I already have a perfect setup. Okay, I don't have a non-uniform element. I have a uniform element. Therefore, um, I don't have to use H, uh, HKDF uh, to, to, to derive new keys. If my initial key material, the master key is not a uniform random element, then I may have to use HKDF. This, this approach will not be effective there. But for now, uh, for this context, this is perfectly fine, right? There's nothing um, against uh, using AES um, and you encrypt it at points uh, one, two, and so on. And then you put them together to create uh, enough number of keys you wanted, okay? And you can call, um, suppose you want one, one, suppose you want say two AES keys, each key must be of size 128 bit, then you call it two times. Right? The first time you call, you get the first key. Second time you call, you get the second key. Okay, that's pretty much it. So that's all. Thank you very much.